from you for what promises to be another very interesting webinar, this time on the 2022 interim budget proposals and the impact to various business sectors. So as always, we have a line of speakers who will deliberate on the impact of these proposals for various sectors. To commence today's webinar, let me now invite the president of CMA Sri Lanka, its founder president, Mr. Lakshman R. Vatavala, to deliver the welcome address and opening remarks. May I also remind you, in the interest of time, we have restricted each speech for 10 minutes. So what I will do, is, uh, this limitation is only for the other speakers, not for the main speaker. So what I will do is, at the end of eight minutes, I will give a reminder that there are two more minutes left. In the event of the main speech, I will give a reminder at the end of the 20th minute, so Mr. Anavira can conclude the presentation after 25 minutes. So over to you, Professor, we would like to hear from you, your opening remarks, and also we want, to, we want you to welcome the audience. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruchira, and uh, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, today we are having, as we mentioned, the uh, Interim Budget 2022 Solutions to Economic Crisis. Uh, first of all, I must uh, welcome our panel of speakers and also the uh, our moderator and uh, the uh, participants who have logged in. So today uh, we have invited, uh, actually Mr. Atul Ranavira is our key speaker who will give the tax proposals. But since we are also going mainly to the solutions to economic crisis, uh, we have taken the different business sectors and uh, they will be commenting on the different areas. And I'm sure that uh, this will enable us to see because we are looking at the solutions and if you really look at the budget now this uh, interim budget uh, sets a tone for sri lanka's reform path mainly aimed at the public sector or the government sector and the state-owned enterprises so while they are reforming themselves uh, the real work uh, will have to be done by the private sector uh, today, uh, we are all happy because uh, the IMF uh, on the 1st of September have announced the staff level agreement uh, reached for a four year extended fund facility worth US dollars 2.9 billion, which will uh, reassure our foreign creditors. Now, that is very essential uh, in this uh, time of crisis because we are in a bankrupt situation, unable to pay our creditors. So the IMF uh, agreement will give them strength because this would be really uh, uh, confirming that uh, Sri Lanka is going to uh, on a path, what we said of recovery, but also good management. Management, management of the public sector, and of course, the state-owned enterprises, where the private sector uh, would be also be able to uh, reach the goals that are required and the full development uh, would be with the private sector. Now, uh, the conditions are not very good uh, because they have said the economy uh, this year is uh, supposed to contract by 8.7%, so which means uh, Things are not going to be very good. And this uh, also they have stated the crisis impact has been disproportionately borne by the poor and the vulnerable. So that's another key uh, uh, statement that has been made, which we need to consider because uh, the poor management, the mismanagement, uh, the financial indiscipline has resulted in this. and. Uh, uh, people, the society of this country are going to be very seriously affected as a result of this. Then also there is a default on the sovereign uh, debt, uh, which will give uh, serious issues for debt sustainability. Now that's what the IMF is trying to correct, where they are trying to put it into a shape that will enable us to continue our normal economy and the other areas. 
then the other important thing that they have mentioned is of course the anti corruption and legal framework now one of the areas things that we have to look at is that all these things can be stated but unfortunately it's the implementation now all those who are here the uh, uh, are from the private sector they know that they are the implementers of all their uh, actions that they are doing if they don't implement it if they don't uh, run their businesses profitably they will have to close down but the government has not realized this they think that they can collect money from everywhere and run their run the country and today we are in this very serious situation uh, where people are going to suffer but we have to when we say suffer we need to make sacrifices that is uh, okay but we need to be rebuild the country in order that it can come to this stage because i can uh, just uh, tell you one thing now the state owned enterprises uh, are really mismanaged they don't have proper managers you if you even if you take the largest state institutions the management they have uh, should be very efficient i can give you one example because i've been involved in the state corporation sector i remember in, uh, in 77 when we opened the economy uh, and then maybe about 79 80 although i was in the private sector i thought that i will also help the public sector so i was given one corporation uh, at that time called the uh, leather products corporation a corporation that have been running always but i can tell you that uh, uh, once i went there we had the foreign assistance from the unido we were able to use the modern techniques we were able to uh, uh, reduce the cost the new technology that was introduced the production uh, went up as a result uh, with new machinery that were installed it was running at a profit so today we need to look at that how the productivity can be improved the efficiency can be improved where good management will run these institutions so uh, i was just listening to a few of the budget uh, uh, the budget debate uh, i think the timing is very strict i think our moderator mr ruchira per mentioned that he will uh, go there the timing is uh, very strict but also uh, they have all realized that we are in a crisis situation normally they are talking various other things either scolding anyone or doing something but today uh, from the speeches that i see it's a good uh, Uh, that the interim budget has done a lot of good for them at least they are now talking uh, some sense and they will be able to bring this country to a good situation just one more thing that i want to tell you is that you know when the golden key collapsed what happened to the directors all the directors were locked up in uh, jail today those who have collapsed the government where are they so why have a, a one 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 uh, principle for the private sector and another principle for the government sector if go golden key the same principle that must apply to the government sector also but today all the people who have mismanaged the economy have gone up so i i don't want to uh, talk too much uh, because i am sure that uh, our panel of speakers we i must thank all of them that they have all kindly agreed to come and uh, that they will be able to explain to you what they can do to rebuild the economy and uh, mr atul ranavira will give you the total structure of the tax uh, what is been uh, uh, proposed and uh, what are the new legislation that are to come of course vat is always increased that it can be increased but then uh, people have to improve the productivity that is the key area and that if we can do productivity efficiency everyone must work today we as a management accountant the expenditure control is one of the most important things so i am sure that the cost and management accounting the costing of products the pricing of products all those are really uh, the uh, uh, function of the certified management accountants incorporated by an act of parliament so i am sure that we will be able to create value uh, not only by the cma but all by all those who are present so thank you and let me let me hand you over to the moderator uh, thank you professor thank you very much for sticking to the time i must thank you on behalf of all cma members and on behalf of others for organizing this kind of webinars for the knowledge of all so moving into the webinar today so now i am moving into the keynote speech the keynote speech today would be delivered by mr atul ranavira he is no stranger to cma a very good friend of cma he is the managing partner of ranavira associates 
and Mr. Anavir will, pres will present the key takeaways or key highlights of the 2022 interim budget proposal. Over to you, Mr. Anavir. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, without uh, without spending much time, I'll just start the uh, start today's session. Uh, but then I will share a PowerPoint presentation which I have prepared. But with the limited time period, I'll um, I'll try my best to manage within the uh, limited time period. Right. Uh, if this screen is visible, uh, not yet, Mr. Atala. Not yet, yeah. Now it's all right, I think. Yeah, now it's all right, yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. Interim budget 2022. This time, the interim budget 2022, this uh, four months interim budget, when the finance minister read this budget, he combined this along with the recent past pro budget proposals, what they have announced. As all of us know, in latter part of May, uh, the government uh, announced certain tax uh, reforms, changes. Now, with this budget speech, they have connected the, uh, those suggestions, what they have made, right? Now, the, when we take the introduction, the Minister of Finance uh, presented his this three months interim budget on 30th August, 2022, uh, three days back. Uh, in that, he highlighted four aspects, namely country's current economic crisis, he has evaluated the country's current economic crisis, then the, the, the causes for these crises. When he was evaluating the causes for this crisis, he has highlighted three points. One is short-sighted economic practices. These are the things which has gone uh, wrong into the economy, the uh, short-sighted economic practices. Then business nationalization policy, even the business nationalization policy he has recognized as, as a cause. Then poor uh, policies applied on foreign direct investments, right? Now in this, when he was touching this business nationalization policy, he has quoted a, a statement given by a JVP, the, Mr. Hanun Nethi, saying that government shouldn't do businesses. Then he um, explained the solutions for economic crisis. What are the solutions? In that, he said that we have to change our mindset. We have to change our mindset to suit with the modern world. Then he suggested two the, uh, methods of solving the crisis. That means that is some type of an analysis. It analyzes short-term recovery actions and long-term recovery actions. On the short term, he highlighted that I am giving support from IMF. In long term, he mentioned that uh, planning for at least 25 years. Now we will see the depth of the crisis. Now if you'll see the um, uh, data uh, of uh, the the government revenue to GDP in 2019, it was 12.7. Then 2020, it came down to 9.1. Then 2021, it came down to 8.7%. Tax revenue to GDP has come down materially. At the beginning of 2022, um, he has mentioned that it is only 8.2%. Then budget deficit. Budget deficit has gone up materially. In 2019, 9.6. Then in 2021, it has gone up to 11.6. Then the government debt to GDP. Government debts to GDP. In 2019, it was less than 187 percent. But in 2021, it has gone up to 105 percent. And at the beginning of 2022, it it is it was almost 110 percent. Therefore. Government has to concentrate on the revenue targets 
now, um, as per their plan, by 2025, they are planning to have 15% revenue of the um, against the GDP. 15%. I don't know how to increase up to go up to that level, but we have to be positive. Right. Then the reasons what they have analyzed, um, uh, fiscal, you know, as a result of these things, the fiscal imbalance has happened. Then the foreign currency shortage has happened and poor credit rating has occurred. Right. Then to overcome these things, they propose that fiscal consolidation plan that is revenue enhancement and cost reduction and proper tax administration, right? Now, if you'll see this recent, the four days back announcement, if you'll analyze that, now uh, what they are planning to do is to enhance the revenue and effectively the um, effective expenditure management. That means the expenditure to be cut down and income to be enhanced, right? That is the plan. Now, we CMA uh, should think about, uh, should support these things, right? Then if we'll see the proposals, what they have given, these are the administration related proposals strengthening the revenue administration system. To, uh, to advance the revenue administration system, strengthen that, we have to have efficient tax collection, proposed strengthening the tax administration system. In that case, we need efficient tax collection, strengthening the tax compliances, and prevent tax avoidance. Preventing tax avoidance is very much required because we know. Uh, that there are a lot of the um, tax avoidance cases are there instead of tax planning, um, majority of the people, they select the avoidance, right? And in this uh, said, now he proposed that anybody who is re any resident person who is reaching 18 years of age to have a tax registration mandatory tax registration for um, all individuals who are reaching 18 years of age, right? That's a good idea. Then to strengthen the revenue administration, to strengthen the revenue administration, he proposed that we have to apply technology and the tax bodies, especially with relate to these uh, tax, uh, tax authorities, main tax authorities, he has selected the main tax authorities as Sri Lanka Customs, IRD, and the Excise Department. Especially for these three entities, he is proposing that we have to have better technology application and regular tax bodies. That is very much important. Right. Then in addition to these things, recently there was a commission, the um, Presidential Commission on Inquiry into Sri Lanka Customs. And there are so many recommendations in that. Now he is proposing to implement these, the recommendations as early as possible. I'll cover the tax part um, um, after this administration things. Then the uh, reviewing multiple tariff rates. Now in the customs, especially the tax, um, the duty uh, tariff, no? there are multiple tariff rates. Now, when we are having multiple tariff rates, there are misapplication. There may be misapplications also. Therefore, to review these things and minimize the tariff rates, tariff slabs, or different tariffs. Then modernize customs administration through automation. Okay. Then integrated IT systems to streamline the operations of bonded warehouse. That means now we have recognized that um, connecting with the bonded warehouses, there are a lot of um, uh, evasions are happening. Then in Sri Lanka, BOI as well as customs, both parties are handling custom operations. Therefore, they are, he is proposing to harmonize these operations uh, in, uh, between these two entities. Then efficient tax collection, strengthening the tax compliances and preventing tax avoidance, that is the main idea. Then uh, government um, um, uh, movable and immovable properties, 
to make use these immovable and immovable properties in a productive way. Then review the activities of project office and units. Now we know most of these government entities are having various project offices and units. And some of these project offices and units are not properly uh, administrated. Therefore, he says that it is to be reviewed the activities of these things to minimize um, uh, uh, applications. Then introduction of online revenue collection system. Now, especially this governmental authority, the local government authority, especially in Colombo, of course, it is already automated, but in most of the other places, it is not much automated. Therefore, he is proposing that all local government authorities to be automated with relate to the revenue collection. Then he is proposing to have joint venture uh, business entities with private parties. In long run, I don't think this is a um, wise decision. Uh, my personal view, of course, the government should uh, give away the business activities. Business activities to be handled by the private sector and the government uh, should think about the service sector. Right. Anyway, then um, there's another serious statement. He says 20% shareholding state banks to the depositors and employees for cap recapitalization. Why it is needed to recapitalize? That means indirectly it says the liquidity situation of these state banks are not up to the level. Need recapitalization. To help or to, um, to recapitalize it, he is proposing that 20, up to 25% 20, 20 of the shares to be allocated to the depositors. That means against the deposit, he is uh, proposing to allocate some shares. This will be a serious statement. Anyway, we'll move forward. Other non-tax related proposals, I'll just read uh, without explaining. Now, various trade barriers are there at present, and he is going to uh, proposing to minimize these trade barriers. Then, uh, to promote spare parts to manufacture various parts, materials to manufacture electrical, electric bikes, duty concessions on that. Then, uh, granting duty concessions to promote packaging of local products. Mainly, it says equipment and um, uh, uh, yeah, mainly the equipment with related to the equipment and accessories. Uh, he is proposing to grant some tax con duty concessions. This access uh, equipment and accessories using for local product packagings, like maybe vegetables or maybe for export purposes or something like that. Then, new legislation he is proposing to launch so many new legislations. Then the farmers, small farmers, the loans, what they have given to small farmers and stuck this, if these farmers are stuck with repaying of this loan, not the pay, not the, the interest outstanding, but the capital outstanding to be right off, the capital outstanding to be written off, and that is to be borne by the treasury. Then, to promote dairy farming in Sri Lanka. Then to expand the renewable energy sources in Sri Lanka and for that purpose to allocate government lands like solar projects and all or wind projects, they can allocate the government lands and promote the renewable energy sector. Then reduce the government and semi-government employees retiring age. Now at present it is 62 and 65 years, semi-government 62 others 65, and they are proposing to reduce it to 60 years with effect from 31st December 2022. I think this is a very good proposal. At the same time, they should allow them to voluntary retirement after 55 years. Then the, the capable people, they will themselves retire and start on their own. They will do various productive activities because it is very much required to increase the domestic production. 
right parliamentary committee to be appointed to look into the revenue increase uh, increase in, in revenue of the uh, government to get increase the revenue then they are proposing to uh, propose uh, the proposition to have a new central bank act then they are proposing to introduce a system which is operating in uk inspector general system this is an independent management system then they are proposing for government sector companies the government center entities department boards and corporations and all uh, when they are replacing when they are buying vehicles to go for electric vehicles go for electric vehicles then state owned enterprises restructuring unit uh, to be uh, activities to be implement especially with relate to sri lanka airlines ceb and cpc then national debt management agencies to be set up then for this maha maha season um, uh, they are proposing to give support to the farmers and by re reducing the fertilizer prices and by of other means then education health digitalization private sector uh, public sector and social security then to promote the fishing industry because uh, this prices of kerosene has badly affected to them then railway services to be improved and use this railway transport service for vegetables and fruits then for, uh, to improve the tourism for that uh, to appoint a committee to look into that then uh, for tourism industry projects he has allocated some money to promote the tourism industry project then the uh, other things like samurdhi and low income families and pregnant mothers uh, some allocate some special allowances i'll now move to most important uh, part that is the taxation now when we are talking this taxation we have to um, uh, correlate it with the uh, uh, the proposals what they have given in latter part of may now personal income tax as i mentioned every every resident individual who is reaching 18 years of age to get a mandatory tax registration then the personal allowance to be reduced from 3 million to 1.8 million personal allowance of an individual to be reduced up to 1.8 million then the tax rates to be replaced with new tax rates and the slabs to be reduced at present we have 3 million 3 million slabs and the tax rates are 6% 12% and 18% now they are proposing to have 1.2 million slabs and the rates are 4% 8% 12% and it um, uh, at present we have the maximum rate of 18% that will go up to 32% then we'll move to withhold in tax most of the withhold in tax have been abolished with effect from 31st december 2019 now they are proposing to re reintroduce this withhold in tax especially the employment income at present only the non resident persons employment expatriates employment income is liable to mandatory liable to advance personal income tax or pay call advance income tax advance personal income tax but they are trying to reintroduce make it mandatory for all employees with effect from first this october 2022 first october 2022 they have to legalize these things within this month then the withhold in tax on other things on interest 5% dividend 14% rent above 100000 rupees 10% and all other cases 14% these are the new rates what they have proposed out of these things the interest on individuals interest on individuals will be a final withhold in tax dividend will be a final withhold in tax for any person any shareholder dividend will be a final withhold in tax in the case of interest it will be a final withhold in tax only in the case of individuals mr then, Atul, excuse me you have five more minutes to wrap up okay okay right withhold in tax on service payments 
service payment they introduce on any payment above 100,000, there's a 5% withhold in tax and they are reintroducing senior citizens, personal allowance on interest, special allow a special exemption on interest of 1.5%, 1.5 million. Then corporate income tax, they are proposing to increase the standard rate from 24 to 30, then the lower rate of 14% to 15%, but the manufacturing rate of 18% and liquor tobacco gambling um, uh, betting rate of 40% will continue. Then in the case of dividends, in future, it is liable to 14% by anybody, including non-residents. Then certain tax holidays, uh, the, um, out of the tax holidays, five tax holidays to be removed, but the effective dates they have not mentioned. I'm not going to read these five things because we can share this PowerPoint presentation with you all uh, to manage the time. Additional deductions on marketing and communication expenses at present, we have 200% deduction. That 200% deduction will be reduced to 100% normal deduction with effect from 1st April 2023. Then uh, with related to the VAT, they have already, uh, it was reduced to 8%, increased to 12%. Again, this 12% already increased to 15% with effect from yesterday. It is already legalized. Then the VAT threshold of 300 million, they are proposing to reduce to 120 million with effect from 1st October 2022. For that, they have to pass the legislation, I mean the legislation. Then there are certain exemptions to be removed and condominium apartments, they are making liable to VAT with effect from 1st October. And removal, removal of tourism sector, now we have 0% tax rate, that to be increased up to 15% uh, because the new rate 15, right. Then social security levy, it has already implemented but already billed, but the bill to be passed in the parliament. That is the rate is 2.5% on import capturing, providing of services and trading. Uh, on these things, certain turnover in the case of importing and services, 100% of the turnover liable to 2.5% uh, SSCL, um, but manufacturing 85% of the turnover in the case of local product distribution, 25% of the turnover, other retail and wholesale, 50% of the turnover. The other threshold will be 30 million per quarter. Threshold will be 30 million per quarter and the registration requirement 120 million turnover during past period, that is 1st July 2021 to 30th June 2022. Then telecommunication levy already legalized. It is now 15% already legalized. And betting and gaming levy to be increased to uh, with effect from 1st January 2023. Um, uh, the rates are, I have given these rates. I'm not going to read those things. Then, yeah. Now, when we see these things, to make all these things to be legal, the things to um, um, uh, uh, these things to be legalized within the month of September because majority of these proposals are to be implemented from 1st of October. Therefore, we can, we can assume that the government will legalize all these proposals within the course of this month. Right. Uh, with that, I would like to wind up my um, uh, delivery part and thereafter, we will join uh, with the question and answers. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Mr. Navira. Thank you very much for having to restrict your presentation. This was purely done in order to manage your time. I am sure if they have any questions, they will ask during the Q&A during the Q&A session. Now, let me tell you now, if you want to ask any questions from our presenters and speakers, you can always use Q&A option. Please put all your questions under the Q&A so that I can take up these questions during the Q&A session. So now I would like to move into our next presenter, Mr. Duvind Hulangamura. Uh, Duvind, I think you were not there initially when I said for each speaker, we are allocating 10 minutes. So at the end of eight minutes, I'll give you a reminder to wrap up the presentation in another two minutes time. Mr. Duvind Hulangamura is the vice chairman of the Sinon Chamber of Commerce, and he is the senior partner and head of tax 
of Ernst and Young, and he will deliberate on the impact of these proposals for the business sector. Over to you, Dimitri. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much uh, for inviting me yet again uh, to CMA to uh, make a presentation. This is the second one ready for the week, right? Last week. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Professor, for the confidence you have placed as Elon Chamber and myself. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I don't have a prepared uh, presentation uh, for you, for the listeners. Uh, once again, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, uh, when you say the private sector perspective, if I give you from the budget, if you look at the budget of this year, and if you go through the budget speech, uh, you can see the emphasis is largely on stabilizing an economy that is in crisis. Uh, I don't have to go to detail about the crisis. We all, all of us know about the crisis we are facing currently. Uh, but the budget will always largely concentrate on the fiscal side of the crisis. Uh, if you look at the uh, budget speech given by the president, uh, our estimated income, a revised estimate is about 2 trillion. And the in terms of expenses of which 1.8 trillion come from taxes, and the estimated uh, expenditure is around 4 trillion. So we are talking of a uh, budget deficit of about uh, 2 trillion for the balance part of the year. So obviously, uh, this has to be financed largely through increased taxes. So Already the VAT has been increased from 8% to 12% and then thereafter uh, to 15% uh, with it from yesterday. Uh, so you can see which way uh, the revenue consolidation is coming. Partly it will restore what was there in 2020, partly it will give additional revenue in order to uh, manage the deficit. Uh, the IMF requirement, if you look at, look at the IMF report yesterday, is for us to achieve a surplus of primary account of at least 2% by 2025. So to get to a 2% surplus on the primary account, we need to collect uh, additional, there's additional, uh, we have a primary account deficit of about a trillion at the moment. And to collect additional 600 billion, is 1.6 to 1.7 trillion, we need to collect additional revenue. So where is the revenue going to come from is a question. Uh, so the revenue can come only, in my view, uh, largely from the indirect taxes. So if the indirect taxes go up, it can't go up beyond a certain percentage. But I think 15%, SSL proposed to be 2.5%, it's always a bit half percent. So then where does increase come from? You expand the net. But as you expand the net, that will include those who are not in the system now because of default and the wide variety of exemptions that we currently give. So I was told by information suggest that uh, the exemption list in the VAT Act is being re-looked at. And most of the exemptions are the absolutely essential items, one or two key items will be kept and the balance will be removed. So then how it will affect the private sector is that the cost of living will definitely go up. The price of goods and services both will increase by reference to the increase in VAT as well as contribution. That's on one side. On the second part is the financing of the budget deficit. So I don't think we can bring structural changes overnight to reduce government expenditure. Although there's a huge cry to reduce government expenditure, wastage, et cetera. Uh, otherwise, we all acknowledge there must be element of wastage and excess. I don't think we can uh, restructure the government service by sending the government service home or reduce the salaries overnight. It will take some time. So until such time, we have to finance budget deficit by borrowing, which means uh, the interest costs will remain at the same levels they are. So when the interest costs are also high, the taxes are also high, obviously there will be a contraction in the economy. The uh, private sector will not be able to borrow at these rates and invest and make profits. Also, there will be twin prone attack, that is the increase in taxes. So, in my view, the private sector will have to storm the weather. It will have to go through a lot of hardships that we didn't previously go through. 
But if you are to overcome this current economic crisis, I don't think the government has any alternative. Are they following on this path? Uh, so that will have uh, casualties down the line. The SME sector will be largely affected. Already you can see the SME sector is how they are functioning. They can't operate at these high rates of interest. Uh, you can see some contraction in the financial services industry where banks and finance companies and leasing companies have cut down their lending and confined to pure collections. So which means the disbursements are coming down. So there will be a contraction in the economy which the private sector will have to keep in mind and absorb. Then on the external front, or the budget doesn't address, the external front is a bigger challenge for us in order to ensure that we have sufficient reserves, build our reserves to a sufficient level where we can at least carry out our daily lives with the import of the essential items. Now, currently, uh, that also we are cut to the bone because we don't have reserves to import uh, certain items, I won't, which I don't call luxury buses as essential. But because of the curtailment of the imports, those sectors that are engaged in the economy, especially import-led economy of white goods, clothes, whatever they call them, are not in a position to carry out their normal day-to-day -day business. So which means if this situation continues, those businesses will have to close down. And the employees of those companies, vast majority of employees might lose employment. So overall, these are some of the biggest challenges that we are facing economy in terms of employees, companies, uh, even government revenue uh, will not be able to achieve the same levels of revenue that we ought to achieve because economy will not grow as much. So our biggest challenge therefore is to make sure that somehow we uh, get the debt restructuring done by negotiating with creditors and getting the IMF tranche into the system as soon as possible so that it will add to the reserves we have and it will enable us to uh, expand the economy by uh, permitting and providing for additional support for the import side of the economy. Uh, we may be able to uh, go to national markets and borrow again at lesser rates if IMF comes. We might be able to get some bridging finance to support our balance of payment. So I think then ADB and the World Bank come and give us budgetary support for the deficit. So, so all depends on how successful we negotiate the creditors and also meet the IMF conditions in order to overcome the external crisis. So we have a twin crisis at the moment, external and domestic. And uh, in my view, we have to have the confidence in the system and try to see how we can overcome it because we don't have any other path and no choice but to go to this path and try to see how we can resolve this problem. Uh, the bank sector is also exposed, as you know, because of the high provisioning uh, of NPLs and ISBs. Uh, there are some issues that they're facing. I can see Roshi here. So, uh, so, so overall, uh, for the private sector perspective, uh, I don't, I can say there's a, a time that's challenging at this, but I always say that we have gone through similar challenges in the past in different forms and shapes. Uh, we know what happened after the 83 riots, what the country went through. We know what happened after the JP riots in 1890. We all students at that time studying for chartered exams. Excuse and me, how, maybe you can wrap up in two minutes. Yeah. So. So I'm saying that we should have confidence in the system and ourselves that we can overcome this. So unless we remain resilient and find ways and means in surviving these difficult times, uh, there is no other choice for us uh, but to go through. So times are going to be tough and tougher in my view and we have to be transparent with the whole thing as President says uh, and steer our economy from the mess that we are in. Of course, at the same time, we need political stability the political stability, we can't go with the economic recovery. And I hope the government has given us some stability at the moment. And my sincere hope is that these fiscal measures the government is pronouncing uh, in the interim budget. I didn't want to get into the details of the taxation, I think Atul has mentioned, but some of those things will get changed as you go along in terms of forms and size and implementation date. Uh, so we can have the same proposals that were announced in May, there can be some changes to those. Uh, so subject to that, what I want to say is that you know, we are into difficult times and tough times, but let's remain confident. Uh, steps have been taken to rectify the situation to a large extent in my central bank governor. 
and the president. And uh, I think therefore those are steps in the right direction. Uh, there is light at the tunnel and let's see how we can go through it. Thank you very much, uh, Professor and then virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Daminda. Uh, of course, as you have said, private sector has to take the burden, storm the burden for the time being. So thank you very much for your comments. Now we are, we are going to move to another tax expert, this time from KPMG. Ms. Suresh Parra, he's the principal uh, tax and uh, regulatory from KPMG. Suresh, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Right, yeah. Uh, so I won't be doing a price presentation also. I'll be making comments with regard to certain proposals. Uh, but before that, uh, let me thank uh, Professor Fine for inviting me to be a part of this panel. And I would uh, like to start my comments by uh, actually adding my voice to the uh, sentiment that was expressed by uh, Professor at the beginning. That is, when there, when there are... There, the accountability, accountability aspect of uh, everything. In the corporate sector, if somebody, uh, if, a, if a director basically messed up and there are consequences, the companies that goes on to give penal provisions uh, as to what, how to deal with that. But in the public sector uh, and among the politicians, unfortunately, it is not there. And we do find basically the uh, politicians and the uh, bureaucrats that created this uh, mess going scot-free and that should not be, and I think as professionals, we should uh, call for accountability of the uh, personnel who are responsible for mismanaging our economy and bringing us at, uh, bringing the entire country that, uh, into this situation. I think uh, that is not something that we should put under the carpet and let uh, go without being uh, dealt with. Right. With that, uh, let me start uh, looking at the tax uh, aspects uh, in detail. And... Uh, First thing that I want to mention is in this budget proposal, like uh, in detail, uh, uh, Mr. Ranavira pointed out, uh, there are two parts. The first one is the, the proposals that were there directly in the budget speech. Uh, that, include, that includes the uh, rate increase of the uh, VAT to 15% and a few other proposals that were there. And there was a reference to certain proposals that were presented uh, or certain proposals that were contained in a document that was released to the media uh, by the Prime Minister's office at that time. I keep saying without a signature also. And uh, that is the content that uh, uh, we all basically uh, keep analyzing and commenting uh, as the tax proposals. But what we have to keep in mind is these proposals have no uh, legal sanction so far. It's a document that was released uh, without any official sanction. So when uh, I believe they, I understand the VAT bill and uh, in uh, income tax bill is being drafted. When these things are being implemented uh, on the 1st of uh, October, there is no guarantee that uh, what we are discussing now will be the, will be the same proposals or same uh, laws rules that will be contained in these uh, new uh, amendments to be introduced. So we have to be mindful when we are taking commercial decisions uh, based on this uh, data that we are discussing right now. For instance, uh, we, according to that uh, proposal in relation to individuals, the slabs are 1.2 million and the progressive rates go from 4% to uh, 32%. We don't know whether that will be the same or whether uh, it will undergo changes when it's being uh, legislated in the parliament. So something that we have to keep in mind and also specifically uh, important when you're uh, trying to change your systems in the uh, companies to uh, in relation to the tax compliance. So I think we have to be mindful uh, with regard to the legal aspect or the official sanction with regard to these uh, wet proposals and the income tax proposals that we are discussing, right? So because uh, it, it has not come from any official source as such. The only official link that is uh, there in relation to that is the reference that was made by the president in the budget speech, but this is not a part and parcel of the, these uh, rates and uh, proposals are not a part and parcel of the budget speech, uh, not a part of that, not an annex here to the budget speech, right? So that's what we have to keep in mind the first thing. Uh, then thereafter, let me go into the details. Uh, the main thing is, main thing that we have witnessed in this budget is the rate increase of the VAT, which again is, uh, I believe is unavoidable. It's not something uh, somebody else uh, could have uh, 
prevented that happening because of the economic situation in the country. Yes, uh, the government is forced to increase the rate. But having said that, I would uh, I would look at I would like to look at this uh, uh, entire VAT system or the rate increase um, in a different way. So when, as I mentioned at some other place also, when the VAT rate is being uh, reduced, uh, when it was reduced uh, in 2019 from 15 to 8%, none of the traders reduced the prices and consumers did not get any benefit from the huge revenue loss that was experienced by the government. Who benefited? The traders. And on the other hand, we have to keep in mind when the uh, rate increased in June from 8 to 48 to 12%, uh, normally what happens is the human behavior is uh, the traders try to make a profit there. That this is called the concept of profiteering uh, at, the, at the times of uh, increase of the VAT rate. We do not have what are called anti-profiteering clauses in our VAT Act. Now in countries like uh, India, this concept of anti-profiteering clauses are embedded in the uh, GST statute itself and there is a separate authority to ensure uh, to, to ensure that any, uh, any trader that uh, tries to make an undue advantage of the VAT rate increase and try to make create, get a profit by uh, increasing uh, the prices uh, not in accordance or not uh, not uh, not uh, in accordance with the rate increase but uh, try to make a profit out of that uh, to punish them and to re recover that profit there's a methodology in other countries uh, and that methodology we don't have in Sri Lanka so in that context uh, when you try to go, when you try to restore the uh, VAT rate 15% uh, to go back there, uh, I think we should have done it in one go. That means in June itself, we should have gone to from 8 to 15 rather than doing it at two stages. The moment you try to do it at uh, two stages, what happens is the, profit, uh, the traders, uh, the suppliers get, a, get an opportunity to make a profit at the expense of the uh, consumers. So I think uh, that's something uh, that... Uh, we have to be mindful, or the policymakers have to be mindful. A point that everybody, the VAT academics point out is when the VAT rate, when, when VAT is being introduced in a country for the first time, yes, there is an increase in the goods and the services, the prices of the goods and the services, but then it stabilizes thereafter. And it's not, uh, it's not uh, good or it's not correct to change uh, the VAT rate frequently. Moment you change the VAT rates frequently, that results in uh, the prices of the goods and services going up uh, and that, that creates uh, inflation as a marketplace. So it, it's not a good practice. So if you introduce a VAT rate, that should not be changed frequently. And you have to be mindful, okay, what is the appropriate rate and then decide and then do it, about, then do it one shot. So that's, that should be the technique and not uh, what we did uh, in June and now what we are doing in September. Right. Uh, then again, uh, what we see is, uh, yes, uh, due to how they say uh, wrong policies or whatever, we we have, we have witnessed the reduction of the VAT base as well as the income tax base, and now we are trying to again regain the uh, VAT base and the income tax uh, base by bringing down the liability threshold, the 300 million threshold. We are bringing down 220 million, and. Uh, we don't know whether that is uh, enough also because it used to be 12 million and still this one to the proposed 120 million threshold is still 10 times the uh, rate that used to be but then is this the right time to do this change uh, i have a big question mark or is there any other better way of uh, restructuring the vat system now another point that i would like that that, that i would like that i would like to see uh, policymakers uh, evaluating is moving away from the concept of the single VAT rate and going for multiple VAT rates. That is basically having a luxury rate, standard rate, and a uh, essential rate or low, lower rate. So, so that uh, benefit could be passed on to uh, vulnerable people using the uh, lower rate. Excuse me, Suresh, you have two more minutes. Yeah, before I started. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, okay. So let me see what uh, anything else that I can. Yeah, okay. And, uh, I think we, we have seen, uh, I, so far I have experienced uh, many questions coming in relation to the imposition of VAT on uh, condominium properties. Uh, maybe during the Q&A time uh, we can discuss that aspect. 
and uh, also uh, another point that I see is uh, this, according to my view, Sri Lankan VA, Sri Lankan tax regime is uh, we cannot uh, define the Sri Lankan tax regime as an equitable tax regime. Now, what is an equitable tax regime? Uh, taxes should be paid, the, the, the broader shoulders should bear more burden. That is the, that's the fundamental concept of taxation. But uh, what we see is the both uh, indirect tax policies as well as direct tax policies are formulated in a such a way, uh, not having any heed to that uh, principle. And uh, the, the, the mix of tax uh, that we have in Sri Lanka, 20, 20, roughly 2080 uh, direct indirect tax uh, uh, tax collection ratio uh, basically points out to the inequity in the tax system where we basically find everybody is paying taxes uh, or rather everybody is, everybody is paying taxes in an equal manner in case of uh, uh, indirect taxation, but then that equality is not the equality that is referred to as the equity in taxation. That is basically you must pay proportionately uh, as to the income that you receive. Now that proportionality does not, uh, uh, how to say, does, does not get uh, taxed uh, when the uh, indirect taxes are being uh, increased. And on top of that, we find basically, again, uh, in relation to direct taxes also, the manner in which different sources are being taxed. We do find, uh, how to say, investment uh, income being taxed uh, at a, lower rate as well as the income generated by sweat and labor being taxed at a higher rate. Now that also goes against the concept of uh, equity in taxation in my view. And those are things that uh, we may, the policymakers need to consider uh, when uh, rebuilding the tax system in Sri Lanka. Okay, Ruchir, I think uh, we'll take from there. Okay, thanks, Suresh. I'm I'm sorry for restricting uh, no, no, no speech for ten minutes, but then in, the, in this case you have to manage all the speeches by five p.m. Right. Sorry. So now after those two expert comments, after those two expert speeches, we are now moving into a different topic: expenditure management and the role uh, that CMA he does, uh, can play. Uh, he is not there, so you can go to oh, the. So other. is not there. No, no. Ah, okay. So then as per the agenda, we will move into Mr. Gajendra's speech. He will also give us expert comments of his comments on the tax proposals. Mr. Gajendra is the, Gajendra is the senior tax partner of Gajma and Company. Over to you, Mr. Gajendra. Thank you, Ruchira. I'm audible, right? Yeah, you're audible. Uh, yeah, the, my... Uh, uh, view on the observation on the tax proposals when you are when you say tax proposals it is uh, taxes now basically there are normally we have only experiencing only one tax generally significant changes in the budget proposal now we have two types of taxes what is going to be legislated tax and the other one is going to be unlegislated tax. The legislated tax, what is going to come in for us, it's uh, what has been proposed is uh, uh, income tax uh, going up to 32%, that is going up to 15%, uh, thresholds all adjusted. Even other changes might come in. Uh, there may be only final withholding tax for dividends, uh, things like that. So now that there's an impact on the tax and, and all these will be legislated. Sometimes uh, rates have been increased. So everything arising from legislation or subsidiary legislation. The unlegislated uh, tax is the inflation. Now, if you to explain, now we have done the analysis uh, at macro level. Even uh, um, Atula said when he uh, analyzed and he gave macro level impacts uh, at uh, on the on the crisis, financial crisis and the economic crisis. Uh, so if, if it, we have to translate, how does this get translated to an individual? Basically, I'm getting taking an example of an individual who had, say, 100,000 rupees in his bank balance before the crisis, right? Say, two years ago. If he had 100,000 in a bank account as an asset, as a deposit, that 100,000 was worth for him at 100,000 at that time, that the value, the purchasing power was 100,000. Now, the same guy having that 100,000 now on the unlegislated 
uh, tax, that is inflation, it has come down to 50%. My analysis of 50% is because being an importing country, the exchange rate was 180, it has gone to 360. So it has it's halved. Uh, others might analyze to be 60%, 40%, uh, you know, much less uh, because of uh, the prices have uh, double, quad, uh, triple, quadruple, quintuple. So on that basis, the value. So I'm just taking the exchange rate to explain this uh, an analogy. Now, 100 has become 50. That is on the asset. Any rupee assets a person had uh, has dropped dramatically, significantly, virtually overnight, you know, in real value terms, right? It's worth only less. Monetary value may be same, it's worth really less. Now, if you take an income, if a person had income, 100,000 before the crisis, and we'll see after the crisis. First one, the 100,000 we will take to a person who is not liable for income tax. But in both the cases, not liable to income tax and liable to income tax, the indirect tax is always there. That is uh, the consumption tax. The, that's what we call it uh, regressive because it's on consumption. Uh, so now indirect tax before the crisis, that was 8%. So if a person had 100,000 rupees, he spent, and he was consuming that 100,000 rupees, he spent 8 rupees for VAT, 92,000, he would have had value of the goods. Now we will see how much the, fellow, the person who is not paying income tax or not liable to income tax has for the same 100,000 rupees after the crisis, that is today. The 100,000 when he earns and hope that he is maintaining the 100,000, now we are not uh, considering a situation where his income has dropped or whether the income has gone up, but I'm just saying 100,000. So 100,000 in real terms is at up to 50, as I told you. Then the VAT is now not 8%, it is 15%. And also now social security contribution levy is a 2.5%. Cascading, you just say 3%. So 15 plus 3, 18. So uh, from 50, you have to deduct 18, you get to 32. So when you continue 32 is the current value he'll have for 100,000 in real terms to buy goods, right? So 32 versus 92. So his value of money, the purchasing power, has dropped by two thirds, 92 to 32, right? So that is the situation of a person who is not liable to income tax. Take a person who is liable to income. If he had 100,000 before the crisis, now he would have paid uh, income tax and we will compare the situation of person at the highest marginal rate. Highest marginal rate before the crisis was 18%. Now the highest marginal rate is uh, 32%. Uh, according to the budget, uh, 31st May budget proposal, highest marginal rate was going to 32% at 10.2 uh, million. But it looks like that even uh, now it will, you will reach faster, uh, even the slabs may be brought down. So now if you have a person who is liable to tax, before the crisis, he would have paid income tax 18 uh, consumption tax VAT, he would have paid eight, so that is 26. He would have had value of 74. When he earned 100,000, he paid his income tax and VAT, he would have had power, value of, uh, value of uh, worth of uh, purchasing power is 74. Don't forget this rupee, the currency, it has no intrinsic value. It, is, it has value because it has been issued by a state government and also because it's a medium of exchange, and there is a demand and supply for exchange of transactions of goods and services, this can be used. So now this says, the, <clears throat> before the crisis, his value would have been 74. Take after the crisis. Uh, now, he has 100,000 rupees income. Um, uh, you take uh, value comes to half, 50. 32 is going from income tax. So he has balances, basically 18. <coughs> if you see when you, if he's going to consume 100, before you consume, you have to pay the tax, no? The VAT is 15% and the social security 3%, 18. So basically he has no value of money of 100,000, zero. 
Now, that is the real ground situation for an individual, right? That is the reason even at the highest rate strata of income, people, when they are embarking on their normal, usual expenditure, they are thinking twice because it, uh, uh, it is sort of unaffordable even for the, of the affluent on a comparative basis. Now, for example, one person was saying that if he, he had to travel, Excuse uh, me, Mr. Gajendran. Yeah. You can finish maybe in another couple of minutes. Sorry? You can finish maybe in another couple of minutes. Yeah, I'm finishing. I finished. Yeah. Right. So, uh, uh, so if, the, if, if he wants to travel, the cost of travel is now uh, three, four times uh, uh, compared to the uh, situation before the crisis. Now, with all this, uh, uh, we are, you know, what is the revenue we are uh, adjusting with the revised estimates is 202 trillion. But in the original budget, they mentioned 2.2 trillion. That is without these new uh, revenue streams. So after uh, the, this thing, it is come down. That means the uh, earlier projection must have been exaggerated. It's only 2 trillion. But at the same time, expenditure side is going up. Right from 2.9, the recurrent expenditure is going up to 3.6 trillion. So, if you see from a tax side, when say uh, uh, legislated tax and unregistered tax, the impact is very severe on an individual at the people uh, end of the day. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Gajendran, for your expert comments. Uh, Professor, since Mr. Mahendra is still not here, we'll now move into the uh, uh, Industry in industry analysis of the tax proposal. So may I speak? Uh, may I start with Dr. Kulatungaraja Paksha, Emeritus Group Chairman of DSA Samsung Group. Sir, we would like to know your opinion on the tax proposal, especially for the local industry. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, now I will start with the VAT situation. Yeah. Now we are as an industrialist, we always uh, <laughs> expect uh, a consistent tax policy because simple and consistent tax policy. But now what happens is started, that started with 8%, went to 12%, and went to 15%. So at every step, the amount of work involved by the industry is, you know, there are goods manufactured, which have been price marked. So in the shelf, so in the supply chain, and the delivery chain also, all these things are there. So there's a hell of a lot of uh, turbulence and involved in change in the prices to meet this because the distributors will not accept the goods from the manufacturer. This is one of the serious issues that industry is facing. We don't mind increase in tax to 15%, but the only thing is this increase has come now for the third time. That is the issue that we are facing. Then the other issue is the another good proposal that have been taken by the president about the railway department upgrade in the upcountry to promote transport of vegetables. I think that's a very good move that have been taken up. Uh, not only uh, from uh, Aliala, I think the whole country from Colombo to uh, Jaffna, ja Beliato to Jaffna, the train is moving. So if we can make use, maximum use of that facility, I think our cost of living will come down and transport will definitely come down. And this will definitely help our SME sector. Then uh, there's another good proposal saying that there's a, they are going to revisit the Employees Termination Act, which is, of course, is a very difficult to determine that they are going to revisit is a good move. Then a reduction of retirement age of 60 years, of course, you know that have been done early to 55 years, but please understand that as far as the private sector is concerned, especially the manufacturing sector, garment sector, etc., the salary is made up of three components, that is basic salary, incentive, and the overtime. But what happens is as age goes, as, as, the, as the workers are aging, the productivity comes down. So therefore, at 55 years, we had the opportunity of terminating them or resigning them. Now this, this will be definitely a burden, especially for the government industry. Then uh, there's another proposal given that uh, to consider the para tariff increases. And they have mentioned that with the uh, facing of para tariff, the exports will increase. I, I really do not understand that situation because exports, anything that is going to be exports, if we are going to import, there is no taxes involved at all because they can import on a deep scheme. So the facing of territory will not benefit export, but it will definitely benefit the imports. So that needs some clarification. Then export-oriented companies, they have increased the tax by income tax by 1%, that is 15%. That I think 
nobody should grumble on that because with the extent it, the profitability has gone up. Then there's another proposal of increasing the samurthi payment from 5,000 to 7,500. I think uh, increasing is okay, but there is no plan to reduce the total number of payments because the sum of the recipients must be reduced. There should be a plan to reduce the number of some of the recipients. That's a big burden to the government. You know, they should be made available to get employment. A lot of the people who are self-employed are still benefited by the sum of that, had, that aspect has been not, not looked into. Then uh, other thing is about the incentive to manufacture electrical bicycles. That's a, that's a good proposal they have made. The 50% value variation, that, that's also that's good. That will definitely benefit the country. Then incentives of alternative energy also as industries, I think that's a very, uh, we should uh, welcome this proposal. And there's another one, you know, the, 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 the restriction of banning of imports and all that will not be met, will not be effective unless the custom, they have already, there's a proposal to modernize the custom operations with automation and welcome to prevent the alleged corruption and all banned goods are uh, corruption. So I think that is a very good proposal because all the banned goods are still come, creeping into the market to illegal channels. So that has to be controlled by transparent and introduced the IT system. Then the information, Mr. Ulangabo, this time Mr. Ulangabo mentioned about, the, not Ulangabo, I think uh, Mr. Apna, uh, Ranavira mentioned about the bonded warehouses, a lot of DJ leakages are going to take place. So there, there's an issue that they, they will be, uh, it will be modern technology with IT in addition will be introduced. Then 50% uh, machinery and equipment on import of high printing material. That's one of the serious issues that we are facing of the high printing material. It has to be uh, it's restricted to import and we need some quality printing metal, not only for the local market, especially for the export. So therefore now the, the, there's a proposal is to reduce the uh, duty on machinery on 50%. That's I think good for because we have to develop the uh, printing industry. Then uh, there's another good proposal that we brought in the government need revenue. As Mr. Ulanga mentioned, we have to face all these issues. Disposal of waste scrap in government institutions. You know, I think I need to explain if you go through the Demetagoda railway yard, you can see the amount of money that is involved, that is there in the railway yard. And also even the CTB and all those places, you find heaps and heaps of tires and uh, scrap that is piling up. So that, I think that's a very good move. Then, uh, there's another proposal to have foreign students in the university, Sri Lanka universities. I think not only foreign students, I think even the local students should also be allowed to get into those universities because right now a lot of students are moving out of Sri Lanka uh, for various other universities, including Nepal and Bangladesh, which is definitely we can keep them here by upgrading our universities and allowing them to enter into those universities that will definitely stop the drain of foreign exchange. Then uh, there's another proposal for which 200 million have been allocated about all the, uh, uh, the people who are going abroad for employment, especially housemates, to give a training so that the, their job level can be, skill level will be elevated. And for this, I think government has done a good decision by uh, allocating about 200 million for the training facility. Then, uh, uh, apart, uh, further, the ban of imports they have done, and I, I think uh, it was mentioned somewhere that it will be the, all these bans will be lifted by the end of this year. I think the, this, the, the, there should be a consistent policy in the special de defined time frame. Because already, if you see the papers, uh, there are two companies that have been already set up to manufacture refrigerators and various white good man manufacturing. So the equipment, the, when they are starting manufacturing and if they open up again, definitely there will be a problem. So I think that, that will be very clearly identified when they open up, whether they will be open up with the, again, high rate of duties and all then because you can't ban it permanently. So there should be an opening on must come up, but it will be at a reasonable rate of duty to protect them. Then uh, uh, there's another one, the export houses. We need export houses that, that has not been touched in the budget because the SMEs can't export. SMEs need an intermediary. That is why there's an export house concept have been brought in that has not been addressed in the budget. So I think that has to be addressed. Then uh, all government institutions, must Excuse be encouraged me, to buy local products. Excuse right. me, saying you have two more minutes. Yeah, buy local products. Right now, there's a saying that you have to buy, but it's not made mandatory. I think uh, to promote local industries, all the local manufacturers who are manufacturing now are of, of high quality and they have got all certifications and all that. 
and most of them are exporting. So there's no reason why the government institutions cannot buy those products and go give preference to those things because when we're importing, well, there are a lot of malpractices are taking place. Then other thing is, uh, there's another area that government has missed or omitted to get the revenue. Now, clearly the postal staff from 15 cents have been, 15 rupees have been increased to 50 rupees. So they will need the revenue. But highway, highway tax is 400 rupees from the day that we started. When the dollar is 160 rupees or the 400 rupees, now the dollar is 300 rupees, still 400 rupees. And that also, there's a foolish proposal that was made by a finance minister. After 10 o'clock, it has been reduced by 50 rupees and 350 rupees. I think we, we need money. I think there, nobody will grumble to increase this uh, the road tax, highway tax, because that have been there from the day that have been started. So therefore, I think that is something that we have to look into. Then SMEs, regarding SMEs, uh, as uh, Mr. Hulangamu mentioned, uh, SMEs actually is a very difficult situation because of the new high rate of interest. So there is uh, there, there should be some sort of relief that we given to SME. And there's a proposal that we have made to be to follow the principle, the system that is followed in India to be to bring the supply, uh, the SME into the supply chain and payment program to be made for SME. I think that have been we have professor whatever have been proposed many times, but unless it's not been redirection, I think we have to uh, inform the government to take uh, positive direction, to positive action to implement that proposal as implemented in India so that all the SME sectors who are that tight uh, linked uh, capital tightness for them because of the working capital requirement, if the payments are received by the, in the supply chain within 14 days, I think the, the bank interest matter will not matter for them. So that is something that we have to push to the legislature. Well, thank you very much. That's all what I have to say. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your expert comments on the impact of budget proposals for the local industry. So from the industry, now we are moving into the agriculture. To talk about agriculture, we have uh, CDA Professor Buddhi Marabek. He is the CDA Professor representing Faculty of Agriculture from University of Peratidia. We have met before. We would like to know. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Professor Vatavala and CMA for inviting me for this occasion. A lot of things have been said about this budget, which is uh, effective in the short term for four months. And when we look at the budget, we know we have to look at the, the, the look at it at a holistic uh, perspective to, to consider the overall development aspects. But since my topic is on agriculture, I will focus on agriculture and extract material out of uh, out of the budget to show you uh, what's going on. Well, lots of things have been happening and it's interesting to see this short-term budget have referred and has a lot of reference to agriculture as well. And when you look at the premise with respect to agriculture in this interim budget, Budget. And I, I see that there's, there's, there's a lot of things that have been identified about the food insecurity and the need to tackle it. And of course, the decrease in harvest, lack of agrochemicals, all those things have been recognized correctly. And more importantly, the need for a fusion between agriculture and entrepreneurship, the value of value chain development, the youth, technological interventions, the productivity enhancement, avoiding hidden hunger, more importantly, looking at protein and malnutrition and undernutrition then the capacity building for post harvest and the importance of promoting export oriented agriculture. Now, there are a lot of things that have been proposed in the budget to overcome these problems that we have faced in the, in the, in the recent past, especially and to, and to look at the future in the short run, especially. That the, the important point that I want to highlight here is that as many members who presented a little while before me, who was focusing on, on the implementation aspects, we all know Sri Lankans, we Sri Lankans are good at planning and we have been planning well and the policy making has been done well but in majority of the cases we have failed miserably in the case of implementation so my assumption today is that what the good things that have been proposed in the in the interim budget to 2022 uh, will be implemented as planned so with that assumption i'm going to talk to you about some a lot of good things that have been proposed in the budget which will definitely set the stage and also have a good foundation for example in order in order to make sure future agricultural development will take place as we expect it to happen i mean coming out of this 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 deep hole that we have been 
moving in and I'm sure there will be economic as well as agricultural revival if you try to implement these things. So one of the important things that coming out of the budget is to fuse uh, agriculture entrepreneurship and there's a focus on youth. Youth agricultural companies have been proposed and a lot of focus have been given to value chain development and promoting export agriculture, which will help the agriculture will be con converted into a more entrepreneurial business in the, in the near future as well as I'm sure there will be a spin-off and spill-off effects for future as well. Then the much needed productivity enhancement, we have been facing a lot of issues in the recent past because of man-made crisis. Not easy to overcome them quickly, but then they are, the country look like it's in a good path if the proposals are being implemented. Yeah, I'm really happy to see there are certain efforts being taken to reduce foreign exchange rain, to strengthen the agricultural economy, and more importantly, the livelihood of the farming community, basically through productivity enhancement. What is really needed for the upcoming season and the future season is to strengthen, is to strengthen the seeds and planting material production. They are the correct path, correct decisions have been taken to support it heavily. Uh, of course, uh, the, the money that is allocated may or may not be enough. That's not the issue, but considering this as an uh, important budget proposal is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good way forward. And about the input supply, a lot of things have been mentioned. The support that we are going to get from development partners like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and the Indian Credit Line. We are to provide support where we are, we'll be able to provide the, or, or, or the required fertilizers in the Maha season that's coming up very soon. We know World Bank is going to bring in urea, Asian Development Bank has committed for muret of potash, and the Indian Credit Line has always got down about 65,000 metric tons of urea, which will definitely support the future agricultural activity. And the governments are focused on dairy industry development with uh, with about 250 million allocation, but I still wonder why only dairy development activities have been focused. What about poultry sector, which has been affected heavily because of the lack of raw materials that are available to prepare or to or to or to have the required amount of feed available for the for the for, for the animals. So let's talk about it in a while. These are some important interventions anyway that has been taken to stabilize the agricultural economy. Going further on the same line, the formal training that has been proposed for to, to improve post-harvest technologies, making supply chains more efficient, especially to reduce food miles, food losses at the crucial nodal points in the food system, as well as food prices. One thing, of course, people will, the capacity of people will have to be built. And of course, and there's a packaging, there's allocation, the proposals have proper packaging, and more importantly, even the previous speaker identified quite well about the use of railway facilities, which has been a cry for about two more, two decades previously, requesting the government several times to make sure this uh, railway wherever possible, where possible, where accessible to be used to make sure this, especially the perishables, fruits, vegetables, flowers, well, in cases, tea and other products will be transported from where, where, where is manufactured to the, to the main cities where the consumption take place, including inland as well as export. But these things will have to be taken carefully, but of course to be implemented. But I sincerely hope that the fuel crisis will not have an impact on these all these proposals that have been made. And also we have to understand railway alone will not suffice because in certain parts of the country, there's no rail connection starting from the port of origin. So there should be some intermediate kind of kind of things, kind of efforts that the government should focus on to make sure the transportation of food take place. Even in the recent past, we saw how it happened when the production was available in the upcountry area, that product could not be moved to the Dumbul wholesale market because of lack of transport facilities owing to the fuel crisis. When there's an interesting thing that has come up that the National Food Security Program has been proposed, and it's extremely important to understand the whole program is going to focus on the food system approach. Food system approach means from the time the input supply is made, from production until it reaches the consumer's table, and of course the waste generated out of the consumer plate is managed. So the overall system has to be taken into account in the food system approach, and it's good to hear that the National Food Security Plan is, is for program is on the cards. And there's a proposal being made to revisit agricultural insurance schemes also. It is existing. The farmers also make a contribution, but virtually the total, total expenditure is being borne by the government that should not be the way it has to be uh, revamped and to make sure there's fair contribution coming up from the farming community as well because the benefit will be on there at the end. 
Research and development has been given a focus. This has been done in previous cases as well, but this will be very crucial for a country like Sri Lanka in the future. Their evidence-based decision-making is a must and it's a timely need as well. We saw what happened in this, in, in this country where, uh, of, of decisions that have been made just based on people's whims and fans, based on people's whims and fancies, not considering the real scientific basis or real scientific information that has been made available. Though not directly related to agriculture in terms of interest, I'm pretty sure the national agency for public-private partnership, which has been proposed by, by this budget proposal, will assist the improvement on the agriculture industry as well, because we really see the need as well as the, 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 the essential requirement of getting both private public uh, organization agencies together to make this uh, agriculture industry prosper in the future. And of course, there are proposals for new laws, such as a food security bill, and amending existing laws, such as agrarian development, Act to stabilize the economy and facilitate growth. These are very, very important points that we have to get rid of the archive laws and regulations that are available in the country that hinders the agricultural development and also bringing up a food security bill or food security act in the future regulations will hopefully will make sure that no such irrational decisions will be taken in the future. Remember what I told you, I'm going to be very optimistic in what, in what I'm going to explain and, and sincerely hope that we will not go through the blunders that we have experienced in the past. Well, all these come despite the welfare. Professor, excuse me. The, uh, well, you can, you can that, that, uh, welfare and subsidy programs that have been proposed by the budget as well. The farmer pension scheme, the writing of the cultivation loan was explained a little while ago, so I'm not going to harp on it. And of course, these nutritional meal programs that have been there, but we need to strengthen it few, strengthen it further, especially under food shortage scenario in the, that the country faces right now, food crisis the country faces right now, and we have to make sure this hidden hunger or protein malnutrition especially will not be there in the country because we do not see that happening quickly. Usually the impact of heat and hunger will be felt in about say one to two years time or maybe even more. So we have to make sure all necessary precautions being taken to avoid that. There's a fertilized subsidy that has been proposed which was not very clear to me when I tried to read the whole budget proposal. Look like the new fertilizer subsidy that has been proposed where additional 63 billion Sri Lankan rupees being allocated seems to include the locations that were there, or in other words, the, the government has pledged to the private sector, but has not been paid yet. Look like they are going to cover it as well. I learned about 23 billion Sri Lankan rupees are pending for the people who brought in fertilizer under the fertilizer subsidy program of the government. Several other subsidies for tea, rubber, coconut, and other crops have also been uh, given, but no details are found in. But the further attention is required. The budget has, has, has approached and look at agriculture very positively in the short run. As I told you, it will lay a good foundation in the long run as well. But we really need to focus on certain things if you are going to make, the, make this budget proposal, the essence of it happen on ground effectively for the benefit of the farming community and the agricultural economy of the country. Subsidies. This is something that we have made a blunder in the past, sub, giving subsidies right across to the farming community. And this subsidies should be targeted in the future, especially in a crisis situation like this. We may have to look into subsidies, but I'm talking about future to just be targeted to the most needed and most vulnerable community. And something that I didn't see in the budget proposal that may come with proper plans and programs for future is going into good agricultural practices. I think this should be the government motto and the government policy for the foreseeable future, focusing and, and pushing farmers gradually into adopting good, good agricultural practices practices as been recommended by the Department of Agriculture and many other commodity research institutes, we may, we can come up with initiatives of GAP certification. Unlike a third party certification in organic farming, GAP certification is done free of charge in Sri Lanka. So this is something that we can hop on, move on, and to make sure there will be a good market for the product as well. But in order to do that, in order to get the supermarket chains, wholesalers on board into this, there should be overall policy directive to make sure
sure the farmers also provide adequate quantities of GAP certified products into the market. As I told you, poorly production seems to have been overlooked because this is something that when you look at the hidden hunger, this is where we are people, uh, people, the, our, our population get cheaper protein nutrition. But you know what has happened in the recent past because of the failure of maize production during the last Maha season, thanks to the thanks to the irrational policy decision that was taken, we lost about 65 to 70 percent of our maize production, and that had a bad negative impact, a very strong negative impact on the on the animal feed production. And that's why you see right now the struggle that we have with respect to production and the prices of eggs and chicken meat, which should not happen in the future. And market facilitation is something Professor, that- Professor Buddhi, time, time is up. Yes, time. right, I will do that. Coordination and decision making, this is my last slide. And there's a real need of centralized and real-time agriculture database we to in order for us to take decisions. Initiatives have been taken by the Department of Agrarian Development. There's a Jogavia program, uh, a, a real-time website that has been developed, which will be used heavily this time in order to provide fertilizer to the farming community. We have to upgrade it further. There should be a lot of mapping with respect to cultivation, cultivated extents and so on to make sure rational decisions be made by the government of Sri Lanka for the further development. And there's evidence-based decision-making and outcome-based program which are focused. And more importantly, we should have a holistic country program to make sure identifying priorities, even for research and development, to make sure whatever the targets that have been set, whatever the vision that have been set by the budget, hopefully being implemented exactly that we wanted is to be set and to make sure agriculture will be developed in the future. And we'll have leap jump forward in these four months to come. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rohabuji. Thank you very much for explaining in detail what we have to do actually to stabilize the agricultural economy going beyond the budget proposals. So now actually I would like to move into Mr. Uh, Riyaz San uh, Sanagani. Mr. Riyaz Sanagani is from he, uh, Vidul Lanka PLC. He is the CEO of Vidul Lanka PLC. Mr. Riyaz will uh, explain to us about the impact of budget proposals on the renewable energy sector. Over to Mr. Yas. Okay. Thank you, Ruchira. And thank you, Professor Vadavala. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. So, I'm happy to know the agriculture sector, a lot of input is there, but sad to say that the renewable energy sector it doesn't seem to have the same inputs. Uh, now, at a government policy level, we have set a target of 70% renewable energy by 2030. And many countries are also moving in that line for economic reason and also for environmental reason. And uh, unfortunately, this budget, now if you, our president mentioned something about other countries are moving ahead and we are moving in the same place. He said something about I think if you really look at it, what has been... Uh, the focus which have been on renewable energy, if you go on, we are certainly out not only Ekatana, but I think we might be even drilling down. Now, why I say this is that the budget talks about renewable energy, but it says only about allocating land for renewable energy. Now, for me, this is something like you're trying to address a non-existent or a very insignificant problem. We have to see what is the real problem if you want to develop more renewable energy and go for these targets and then address those. Now, if, in my view, the main thing is the lack of confidence in the industry, because we have a we have a quite a big outstanding to to be paid by CB to the developers and to the bank, and that has eroded the confidence. Now, if the industry is to move forward, this confidence has to be built, but unfortunately, that has got lost quite a lot. So something has to be addressed, and I know we are in a crisis situation. The money is tight. We are in a bankrupt situation, so definitely the credit there will be credit outstanding. But then the economics are far away. This now, if I just want to explain a little bit. Now we are highway quite a lot, about 40, 50 percent dependent on fossil fuel. What is the cost of fossil fuel? The cheapest is coal. Coal is about 40 rupees. Then the diesel, which is about 110. It's a very simple calculation. You take a liter of diesel and divide it by four, you know the cost of a kilowatt hour. Then of course, there's other costs which you can say about 10 rupees. And then now we talk a lot about LNG and we think that will be the uh, real solution. But LNG also today's prices and with rupee depreciation is going to cost us about 65 rupees. 
and the average selling price of CEB is 30 with the new tariff increase. So with all that, if you're going to have such high cost of production of energy and energy is vital for the economy, then the, the CEB is going to be bankrupt and that's going to lead to a bankrupt, uh, to a stall on the treasury. Mm -hmm. So on the other side, if you look at renewable energy, we at the moment, all renewable which was developed in the past is selling to CEB at a price of only 16 rupees. But of course, future cannot be done at the same price. It might be around 40, but with Sri Lanka has less, I mean, we are lucky we have some big reservoirs, developed projects, high big hydro projects. Those have quite a low cost, but you can then average it out to a below 30 rupees. Then the CEB will can become profitable and see then that's a lot of money which can be saved. Because at the moment, this year, the, even after the tariff increase, the estimated loss of CEB is 250 billion. And somewhere down the line, the treasurer will have to give this money. Otherwise, the, uh, there won't be energy in the country and the country will be a total blackout. Mm -hmm. So whichever way, it's going to come to the uh, treasury. So treasury, we need to look at doing something about it. So the renewable energy definitely is one way where we can bring down the energy costs and which can help the total economy. Another thing I think we should have been addressed is the tariff, because end of the day is renewable energy will have to be developed by the private sector. CB has not been successful at it. If I refer to a central bank report of 2020, uh, page 82, it talks about Umawe project, this in 2020, completed 96%. Now today we are in almost end of 2022, that 4% is still not done after two years. So CEB trying to develop project is very inefficient. So I think the private sector has to drive it and private sector needs a case, a commercial case. And the case, the commercial case will come only if you have a proper tariff. I'm glad there was a certain uh, amendment to the acts where they allowed for feed-in tariff, but still that has been happened three months ago, but there's no indication of what's going to be the tariff. It says no publish. It's getting dragged on, very slow movement. So those needs to, I wish the budget will have addressed something on that, it will have been helpful. Then of course, uh, it is third is what I talk about the lands. Of course, yes, you need some amount of land, but not very specific. So if there is some changes in the land tax, where it helps the developers to obtain land much easier than we are now, it's a very cumbersome process, yeah. but it's not in the, it's at the least priority at this moment. So I wish the budget had more, address more on building the confidence of developers and also to come out with a good tariff. So I hope this will get addressed in the next budget so that the renewable industry can move, uh, move further, faster and, it, uh, and actually help the country. The good thing, uh, the, but of course in the budget, there was one silver lining which I saw, it talks about the restructuring and reformation of uh, CB. And I think that it be a good move because like I said, it's running at a huge loss and there's a lot of inefficiency. We talk a lot of time about corruption, but I think inefficiency at SOE levels is far more than, uh, is far, it is far more into creating a wasted than the corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, just to elaborate a little on that, now CB is a company with a turnover more than John Keys or MAS. And it's a, such a huge company has one general manager, one CEO. Now, if you compare with the John Keys or MAs, there will be so many different profit centers and CEOs and GMs will be running different, different units. But here, this one company, one GM, who is it? So obviously this is the span of control so high, he'll never be able to run it in a very successful way. So I think then the, the, there has been a, the restructuring already, the committee has been appointed and they're trying to break it into uh, distribution, transmission, generation. So I think that's a good start. At least it's a very one big monolithic organization. If you can make it to a few parts, definitely I think that will that will be the start. But I think thereafter a lot more has to be done. And I think there has to be also, I would say, a multi-buyer model because the generators or the private developers should have option to switch to different buyers. Otherwise, we are selling on to one buyer and he has mono, uh, monolistic power, very difficult to negotiate or anything. So I think- Yes, very, we can finish now in about two minutes time. Yeah, okay. So it's very important that we, in this restructuring, they look at a multi buyer model and an independent system control. That's a bit technical, but I don't want to go too much into it. So it's very important that they have a 
independence is a system control which controls the generation planning every day so i think very important so i think it's good that at least it has been addressed that there will be a restructuring of cb so i hope it will happen sooner than later and help to reduce the draining of our resources thank you thank you riyas thank you for your comments on the renewable uh, renewable energy sector so now i would like to move to our last speaker for the day mr sanjeev anthony representing the hotel sector we would like to hear your comments especially on the travel sector since 2019 we want to know the impact of these budget proposals on this key sector of the economy thank you mr thank you professor for inviting me again so as you know tourism industry will bring lot of solutions to their country economic problem at this point of time we are dying need of us dollars and we are talking of 4.5 billion dollar industry which we had in 1999 2019 and uh, there's a potential and good point is i saw that government in the budget they are they are targeting 2.5 million tourists that is a welcome move i think it is achievable going forward and also it is a 5 billion dollar industry if you look at from accounting point of view if you look at the future cash flows we are talking about a 60 billion dollar company 60 billion dollar industry going forward so our this is more than our total debt of the whole sri lanka has obtained so that kind of a potential which is available in the tourism industry but uh, looking at the budget proposals even at the interim budget they are touch the tourism but not to the level what we would have been expected to be allowed so one important thing is in the whole this interim budget there are import restrictions we all welcome and we have to control non essential items but also there is another side which we can easily increase our dollar earnings so even the tourism industry is one of them export industries and even the our foreign jobs foreign remittances which we have to see how we are going to increase maximum possible dollar earnings which uh, i have not seen too much of emphasis has been given which is required daily going forward for from tourism point of view it is a uh, industry started picking up now a lot of uh, countries have basically relaxed travel advisories which were there for several months united kingdom switzerland france denmark norway sweden netherlands all have relaxed so in fact from industry point of view we have identified and also we have experienced a lot of inquiries coming forward and also immediately there were few bookings now important thing is now whole world the booking windows are coming down so because of that basically not like earlier we had situations where people foreigners were booking their destinations 6 months ahead 3 months ahead 1 year ahead but now it is basically within two weeks they book so we expect some very good recovery in the industry but um, government has to concentrate much more on the tourism industry i to go forward so ma- most important thing is again we were continue to lobby to position the country and do promotional and marketing activities to tourism development authority they are just starting so i hope that uh, they will keep on increasing their promotion activities and i have not seen in allocation of uh, funding from the budgetary point of view so at least from tourist board sri lanka tourism development authority point of view they are they are collecting tourism development lead from the industry so they have enough funds i think uh, i hope that they will do some promotions to bring much needed tourism i also would like to touch one important thing mainly with regard to railway i think the transportation of food it has been some panels discussed but this uh, railway is a very very important thing from tourism point of view for traveling purpose so rather than if we develop the railway 
lines properly, the destinations which we can use to reduce our consumption on vehicle traveling, even most of the tourists, they love to travel through the train and only the infrastructure needs to be developed. In fact, last week, we traveled to Jakarta from Colombo. That's a lovely, they have a new apartment they have added and that is a very lovely experience which we have, uh, which we have experienced. And we also met few foreigners who are traveling on their own. So another important thing is when we went at the Jatna and met the station master of the Jatna railway because it need to be it is normally a very clean uh, station but it requires to be clean even more. So when we met the first question he told is that lack of staff. So then we basically informed him we saw in the. Central Bank report that they are talking about 14,000 employees who are at the railway. So still this uh, Jatna station was saying that lack of staff. So I think uh, the number one requirement is like the way that they have started reorganizing the electricity board. I hope that uh, railway also will be reorganized and that we can be used as a, one of the main transport uh, transportation for tourists as well as for the locals which can reduce our consumption going forward on the fuel because we need to reduce our fuel consumption so the railway is one very good efficient way of traveling to the destination one of the popular tourist destinations going through railway is at the moment one is Jatna, one is to Ella through Nanway I think uh, that was very, very too popular and a lot of foreigners come directly book online. Online they book the railway as well and then they go through the railway to the elder. So we have met several tourists who work on this method and I hope that uh, we can develop this restructure this as well. So coming back to budget proposals, as I said, one 2.5 million target, as I mentioned, is a welcome proposal and definitely I think the way we are going, we can come close to that and that will solve most of our dollar requirement where we can bring, get, bring the gap of the dollar requirement required for the country. Another one proposal I would touch is that the government also is allocating 300 billion rupees to develop certain destinations. So I think that is at least one more government has identified, despite me to say that the intention given the tourism is not enough in the budget, being a, one of the foremost uh, industries, but still at least allocating 300 million rupees for the development of different destinations. Actually, the, that is one important aspect, and I hope they will appoint a good committee who can, who can spearhead on this. At the moment in Sri Lanka, we have only few destinations which has been popular. Cultural triangle, certain beaches, and uh, they, we have untouched tourist destination. Even Jatna. Jatna has so much to be done. We were in last week, three days in Jatna, going for different, exploring different, different areas, which even being Sri Lankans, we were not explored. And there's a much potential is available. Again, there are new Vellava area, Kotuvi, even Pasikuda, we have uh, top class beaches. In fact, uh, when we go to the heights, uh, in fact, we go to the heights uh, island, that beach is compatible with Maldives. So basically, that is the potential we have. Those are the areas which we can develop new projects and we can attract high end tourists and also government. Uh, Last proposal, they had about three or four proposals is the high end the travel tourism targeting the government, but it is high. Sri Lanka is not only a high end destination, it's a multiple destination. It is low budget tourists will come, middle range tourists will come, high end tourists will come. So, therefore, we have to target all three areas, not only high end, because high end alone Sri Lanka cannot sustain only with high end tourists, but high end tourists going is good. But of course, our destination is a five-star island, we are selling for these three-star rates. So if we sell at the moment, we get about $75 to $80 dollars 
for a day that can easily improve to 125 to 150 dollars that will give us required additional 500 million to 1 billion dollars without doing anything so i think again coming back positioning is and you excuse me we will finish in two minutes yeah thank you Richard. so going forward we are expecting to we are requesting to the tourism development authority to position the country as a five star island we already position as a five star rate which we can get without any effort a one billion dollar additional income and that Mauritius is sad to say Mauritius is a three star island attracting five star rates so Sri Lanka is other way around so we are hope and pray that we can go and uh, finally I would conclude uh, Ruchira saying that um, basically Sri Lanka tourism such a, as I said five billion dollar industry next year to we can it's a 60 billion dollar industry with a cash flow point of view the industry government give more concentrate on that and we can earn required dollars thank you thank you very much sanjeeva thank you very much for your comments ladies and gentlemen that is Ms. sanjeeva anthony executive director jeppin hotels limited so professor we have roughly about 10 minutes before the schedule finish time uh, there were some questions answered by professor buddhi i could see professor buddhi and especially by mr atlo ranavira still there are 14 open questions uh, so shall we go one by uh, one can you take the tax ones first here? Yeah, tax. Yes. Um, this question, Mr. Atla, I don't know whether you can answer. This person is suggesting, is it's a suggestion actually. He is telling, okay, why not we register people upon reaching the age of 18 rather than going through the process? Uh, I think uh, there was a matter on the condominium uh, that uh, maybe if you can explain that one, that would be good. Sale of condominiums, uh, Atula. There is a uh, question there. Yeah, there were there, there were several questions with related yes. conversation. I answered Sorry. all those things. This this is not a complete question. Was given the basic exclusions now. Earlier now that's more a statement. In yes, correct. Yeah, therefore, I don't think there's any answer for that. This this statement, Mr. Atula, do you have any uh, reply to this statement? Uh, this participant is asking why da, why can't we basically register people upon reaching 18 years of age rather than going through this process entirely maybe later no, no actually it has to be an automatic registration no sooner you reach the age of 18 uh, there should be a government authority to, uh, for them to register for taxation that is that should be the in the revenue department anyway the government with the, the government database they should have a database in future for all persons uh, starting from the uh, registration of a birth. Then automatically through that system, they can uh, do this registration. I think that is the best. In most of the other countries, they have that type of uh, allocation of a uh, PIN with the birth certificate. Uh, Suresh, you have any other opinion on this? Do you agree with yeah, that? No, so, yeah, the proposal is a good proposal or the suggestion is a good one that is basically what they are saying is go to the go to the take the nic number or basically go to the citizens register and from there uh, link it to the Indian Revenue department and uh, when you reach the, uh, the 18th birthday uh, register for taxation and uh, send the birthday card also saying happy birthday you have not been registered for uh, at the Indian Revenue department also rather than basically we going and uh, basically try to register. Mr. Kajendran? Basically, I think from what I understand, there is a practical problem for them to do that automatic registration because the identity card number, the number of characters in the identity card numbers cannot be accommodated in the Rami system, I think. So, oh, they, so that is the reason they have to register and then they will give you a, a number per se uh, but I don't know. I heard there are over 17 or 18 million people over uh, 18 years. Uh, I don't know whether the number is correct. That means uh, all of them uh, uh, have to register, and uh, non registration can be a default. It can be a minor default. <laughs> and the default culture is practically, I don't know how it's going to be implemented. Uh, that's the problem of automatic registration. That's what I am told, I'm me to understand. Okay, sir. So maybe this question can be answered by the entire panel. This person is asking, rather than uh, imposing an additional VAT, uh, 
he's basically saying inflation is going to rise to high levels because of the wet increase. The businesses can easily pass the tax to consumers. By trying to solve one problem, we are creating a major problem, not another problem. Rather than this, don't you think a surcharge tax on high turnover would have been better? So maybe yeah, we can start with Mr. Anavira or maybe Mr. Kajandran. Yeah, actually earlier we had this system of surcharge tax. That may be the reason why he's proposing like that. It may be a better idea, but I don't know whether the government is in a position to reach their income because there's a target of a income target. Now, uh, for that, it may be easy to have multiple uh, tax varieties, tax types. That may be the reason why they are proposing VAT and SSEL and all those things. Correct. That's a, that is a, there is a point in that question. Uh, they can have a uh, earlier we had a luxury rate of tax correct, correct. rate of tax for certain types of con consumption so that without increasing all the all the people right across the board you know uniform one uni unitary rate of tax you have a luxury rate of tax uh, there are pros and cons uh, saying that administration difficult and all but i think uh, if you if your numbers are work this is where the, the even the ministry must have a research team permanent team to do these, uh, get the facts and figures and do these analysis and numbers so that uh, how much revenue you are, this is all ballpark figures, back of their heads, they are doing the calculation. So they must uh, have the num facts and figures and decide and say, go to a certain category of transactions uh, and uh, you can tax that at a higher rate. Uh, that is one option. Uh, of course, uh, when you talk of higher rate for high income, even for corporates earning certain income more than certain levels, uh, they must target and, uh, you know, if they can raise revenues. Uh, you know, people will be prepared to pay tax, but they are not prepared to pay tax for corruption. They are not prepared to pay tax for waste, and they are not prepared to pay tax for abuse uh, of power. So rent-seeking, corruption, uh, uh, all that has to be put into place. Otherwise, these monies will be again uh, squandered. So that's a good thought. It's a good thought. Uh, multi rate of tax for that uh, many countries have, uh, even European countries have. The France that uh, first introduced the rate, multi, um, uh, uh, that rate, that system, um, I believe uh, they also have about four rates of uh, tax, uh, if I'm correct. So that's a good thought that uh, we really had a multi rate system. Uh, this is because of the simplification. When you get simplification, the poorer segment of the people get hit more than the richer, higher segment of the people. Yeah, it, 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 to, it, sorry, it is basically trying to uh, trying to ensure the ease of administration Even, as opposed to basically correct, hitting the is, of the yeah, Tax collection not uh, it should be not designed for ease of administration. Administration should be gearing up for the tax collection. Because if you see even now, even the petrol and all, you can have differential rate for people uh, consuming. Now, why should a um, uh, motorcycle or three-wheeler pay the same charge that like that of a person who is going in a premier vehicle? Similarly, even if school fees, uh, government school fees, uh, people, uh, the uh, children of parents who are on the bo bottom, bottom strata of income should have it free. And the people who can have it, who are um, uh, at a high income level, should pay for their uh, fees. There is no issue. So you have to have a system of uh, uh, something that CMA could suggest also. But now, it's, if the ration and system that have been introduced for the fuel uh, distribution is pretty effective, uh, right. and you know, it's like that, yeah. you can come up with some creative ideas. Uh, and uh, ask them, you know, tell the government to uh, um, collect uh, taxes selectively uh, because the principle of capacity to pay has to go. Otherwise, there can be social uprising and social unrest because the 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 the, 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 the number analysis I gave, even the lower strata, the people will find it more and more difficult to live. So this question is common. I think this. Uh, sorry, sorry, you, you were trying to say something. Okay. No, no, I think we'll proceed. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, this person is asking the measures, to the common measures that are there in the budget proposals that can be implemented irrespective of the government changes. Are there any uh, proposals in the interim budget 
that can be implemented irrespective of future government changes no so here what happens is all the proposals uh, will get into uh, law it will be legislated so once it is legislated uh, it's uh, irrespective of the government uh, it should be implemented by the commissioner general so as far as the tax is concerned yeah, that is the situation legislated yeah it should once it is legislated it's a law of the land so whether it's yeah. the green to or not, the other not like the, uh, the, uh, the president's uh, the, the minister's secretary and uh, uh, assistant secretary and private secretary and driver that goes and comes to the ministers yeah. okay thanks suresh so this uh, this participant is asking what if the exemption schedule is totally removed or at least restricted to a limited number of items while reducing the vat rate let's say to around 6% won't that be more beneficial it's also on vat yeah, so, yeah so it, it's like this now when you look at the current, uh, the two countries the new zealand and uh, uh, singapore singapore is considered the number one uh, model when it comes to the concept of uh, taxation of value addition and new zealand is considered the number two in both countries you can see the number of uh, exemptions that are there it's less than 5 yeah correct uh, you you get basically uh, residential accommodation is there and then i think the education is there if i'm not mistaken and just about four five items not more than that but in sri lanka if you take that uh, list and say it's more than 100 uh, items that are there so the ideal ideal solution is yes uh, reduce the uh, number of exemptions uh, uh, to ensure there is to ensure that vat is working all the sectors should have uh, uh, vat and also so by by doing that thing you can bring the rate down but in this current situation uh, you have to be careful what you are going to do here because uh, that can have many much impact it's, it's, it's not that, that is in our under the under this ground reality so it's a, it's a different uh, exercise sanjeev there is a comment when you, what you have mentioned when it comes so, to, when it comes to that you have to be very very careful yeah you have to be very careful it's an indirect tax it is a tax on the poor it is a regressive form of tax the lower strata of the people the uh, get very badly affected marginal propensity to consume the purpose of the exemption list the essential goods the given goods should reach the people without any form of tax whatsoever exemption sometimes might not reach that it has to be zero rate if at all because the, even the input tax also shouldn't be there this includes uh, 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 food basic food the nutrition food uh, health uh, not for the this is i am not again telling for the well to do it is again yes, for the poor health uh, education you know the basic things if you see uh, the list that goes through the vat exemptions go the list that goes through it is arguably it has been stated as essential goods basic but the essential goods the list may be very high in there for example tractor and tractors those type of a thing that is for the farmers you know so uh, uh, this is where you must have a selective form of tax you can bring down to 6% and achieve this rate so if 15% is there then you have another lower rate if you want for certain items at uh, 1% or 0% or something and then a slightly higher rate at 5 6% don't forget this country administered a turnover tax rate of about 6 to 8% at one rate we had 1% 2% 4% 8% 12% 16% 20% 40% rates you know right. so they be administered like that so we have gone into this simplified system of value added tax that is all good so but you have to be careful of the uh, poorer segment of the people because uh, by the end of this year they say at least uh, half the people will be, be uh, below the uh, poverty line poverty line yeah and uh, if you the bread also is now 100 170 rupees and they, there is uh, rumors that that price will also go up very soon or later and uh, they are unable to there is no value for money in their hands and most of the people don't forget there are about 4 million people who are uh, either self employed or daily wage people all of them the income has been heavily challenged so this indirect tax vat you know people of influence in position and power and influence like you and me may be able to influence uh, policy makers 
for self interest and self seeking don't forget too much if push this that we won't be able to go on the roads you know yeah, uh, so basically you have to first look after your neighbor before you look after yourself uh, at this point of time so uh, to to for you to be at peace so make sure these people uh, don't tax too much on indirect tax and vat uh, you have brought to save the that's a social security contribution levy uh, government is easy to do that income tax yeah, is correct. difficult to calculate and collect so you have to do that go you ask the corporates will they want to pay a higher rate of tax for certain profits over, over 2 billion 3 billion they will have a different theory for it and they will be persuasive enough not to tax it then then the government has to decide uh, but this all this any taxpayer will pay as long as the top is clean and corrupt not uh, corrupt free yeah and also i think there's something yes, else that we can emphasize in the situation see this is this is a unprecedented time and as mr gajendran pointed out uh, tax can be a very sensitive uh, topic uh, in this uh, economic environment yes you need to collect the taxes but that collection has to be a well thought of well planned so basically the formulation of the tax policies at this juncture is very important and you need to you need the best effort of the policy makers the best the best policy makers the best people should be get involved and they should take more time and basically decide the tax policies it's not a case of basically uh, doing uh, preparing the tax policies uh, like what we used to do 5 years back yeah, you can't have the, you can't have the same team doing the thing i think you need to uh, bring the better people and then uh, put more effort and create a better uh, tax system to in order to address the situation that is that we are facing here i think if you are making suggestions the suggestion should be seen how to increase revenue from income tax corporate tax and in the income tax uh, also when you say income tax corporate tax not to oh, be anti business so if there is uh, investments uh, expenditure based reliefs have to be given not profit based exemption expenditure based reliefs for investments uh, capital infusion uh, where most of the companies are uh, thin capitalized and uh, leverage set up so for equity enhancement of the equity private companies not only listed companies where the capital base goes up uh, capitalization for the company investments um, r and d um, uh, going green um, uh, training retraining uh, job sec uh, people for job security job granting away where you create employment uh, going into certain uh, difficult rural areas you give some uh, uh, relief not exemptions exemptions to carry back so you focus more on income tax there the mix of the tax revenue should come from income tax if you want social stability and macro economic stability uh, you have to focus on income tax forget focusing on uh, indirect taxes indirect tax uh, that's deadly and if you go for indirect taxes go for however difficult it is uh, go for uh, selective application of the tax uh, pick and choose cherry pick your uh, uh, target to impose tax selection of the base and the selection of the rates exactly should be done carefully thank you sir sanjeev so, this this is a comment actually on what you have mentioned you have mentioned in your presentation that the tourism sector needs rail transport to be there uh, but then of course now this person is suggesting for that to be there we have to first solve the fuel crisis i would like to know your opinion on that yeah so basically what we are proposing is for the fuel crisis the solution is this public transport the other way around basically what we are saying is give little more facilities for the tourists the tourist experience they are getting rather than going in the vehicles otherwise we are worrying vehicles is tourists are paying in dollars so we have to they we have to pump full to go to worrily pasikuda gol everywhere so basically we can give excellent experience like other countries they use the public transport what we are suggesting is tourists even high end tourists would love to travel in the railway if the facilities are upgraded for example one i will tell one thing the toilets is the biggest issue for tourists having at the moment in using the railway in the railway as well as in the station so i think what we are suggesting is rather than going even one bus you know this one 
40 seater bus, we can put close to 200 liters in one pump. So just imagine that one bus consumes 200 yeah. liters of um, diesel. So therefore, what the suggestion is to use to reduce the fuel consumption using the public transport, railway is the best. That is the railway is the best. Right. Now, we may have to close up, Isaac. Yeah, because I, I'll ask this one final question on expenditure management. Uh, since we don't have uh, uh, Mr. Mahendra Jayasekar, I would like to ask from the panelists. Now, we all are from the private sector, but I would like to know your opinion on the age, maximum age restriction placed on the state sector employees. How, how that will help to manage the expenses? State sector? Yeah. Yeah, basically, if you uh, otherwise, if you go up to 65 years and people choose to work there till 65 years, uh, uh, the, you say you have to pay start paying the sal uh, salaries. Here they will they, they can go at full pension because the, there are people who can get employed uh, outside the public sector. Uh, they will prefer this one because they will get yeah. their full pension and sure. then go for this. You know, so so. That's the reason. Uh, reason in in other developed countries there is no age restriction. You can work as much, but that doesn't mean you can continue to be in employment as a matter of entitlement. So here it's a when you get an uh, um, uh, job, per, sort of a permanent job in the public sector or even in that private sector because of a labor laws, it's sort of a lifetime entitlement that you have to be uh, you can you have to, can stay there till you retire. Correct. So basically, this is a and also to allow younger people to come up, and uh, uh, otherwise there is a curb on their growth. So that's the reason I think. Any other views, maybe? I believe after after a retirement age, we can retire them and offer on contract basis. With lesser lesser uh, salary scales, maybe lesser salary scale, mm -hmm. but on contract basis. Some extensions only on contract basis. Then uh, we'll be able to promote the younger people to come into the employment. Professor Buddhi, you are from, I forgot you. You are from a university. I would like to know your opinion on this. The universities originally, we have been allowed to work until 65 years. That has been the original scenario. One of the biggest problems that I see of extension is the younger generation. I mean, take the Department of Agriculture, for example. It's not under my purview. Or I'm not working over there, but there are nearly 1,000 odd vacancies where yeah, people were not recruited because of other issues, not because mm -hmm. of this problem. But when you now try to find even the existing uh, members are going up to uh, 65 years, naturally there will be an issue with respect to bringing in new blood into the system. So there's always issues like that. We have to strike a balance. We cannot lose the experienced personnel. So the contract basis appointment would help so that they can also mold the younger generation uh, to, to bring them up. So there, it has to be balanced in such a way. That's what I think. Okay. Any other views from our panelist? Yeah, I think again, again, here also we have to be careful. This is also yeah. the, uh, how they say, sensitive issues. Yeah, and also, uh, can you can't have blanket uh, policies uh, here. You need to have uh, exceptions for the general rules also. Otherwise, we will have this. Uh, uh, we saw this in our Sri Lankan cricket team. Uh, all of a sudden, a new selector came and uh, chopped all the senior players from the team and put all the young Turks, and uh, they were losing the matches at a rate. And then again, they had to call back the seniors, you know. Sir, <laughs> so I think in the private sector, you are looking at a different angle because now all the younger, they are IT qualified. Yeah. They, they, they are more productive. So, I mean, once you, those who are over 60s, you know, very little are IT qualified than the IT. It's actually very small, so very few. So therefore, the peers, most of the companies they don't like to extend once you reach the 50s who are not the IT less. They don't like to keep them. So there is no other way to remove them unless, of course, you know, you have the uh, uh, compulsory pension scheme. Yeah. So therefore, extension is I don't think, uh, especially the private sector. Private sector in any case, those who are productive definitely will, they are keeping employed on a contract basis, right? They are not allowed to leave. But those who are not productive, they should be aware of leaving, otherwise your overhead will go up. Correct. 
Right. So you have strike a balance there, no? Right. Okay. Uh, Professor, then uh, maybe we can yeah. uh, wind up the session. Uh, I think I have finished asking all the questions that have come there. So do you want to maybe make any closing yeah. remarks? Yeah, I, I will uh, just make a few remarks. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruchira, I think for conducting uh, the moderation and also the panel discussion. Uh, as we said earlier that uh, this interim budget is really uh, uh, setting a tone for the uh, reform, Re Sri Lanka's reform path, mainly at the public sector and the state-owned enterprises. I think that is a message uh, that has to go. And uh, uh, from what little that we can see, that uh, I think uh, uh, has been understood by uh, many, you know, because actually the private sector is quite uh, aware of all these things and how uh, what contribution they have made. Uh, but certainly uh, what we now see is although the private sector is uh, very efficient, uh, they have been doing very well, the stock market is doing very well, the government side has uh, really let us down, you know. So that means uh, uh, what was mentioned, I think uh, there was mentioning about the public-private uh, partnership, you know. Uh, of course, they were wanting to set up a different, separate agency. But I think uh, the main way to go forward is uh, public-private uh, partnership. Because if we can uh, bring in the private uh, expertise uh, to uh, sort a lot of the problems that are there, then it will be happening. Because as was stated, it is really that we have so many laws, but it's on the implementation area. So it may be that... Uh, this implementation is not being done because of various other things. Uh, some of could say political interference, but uh, it may be there to a certain extent, but uh, I think it is also maybe uh, uh, the what they say is much more than uh, what is really there. So the responsibility has to be fixed, the accountability has to be fixed. Uh, then we can see that even the public servants will have to perform uh, they will have to be responsible and they will have to uh, answer for what they have done. So that is uh, one way that we can see that uh, they will be result oriented and that they will ensure that uh, the uh, results could be done. So uh, the tax uh, uh, really will uh, be uh, some uh, area which will result in a problem as analyzed by uh, 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 Mr. Gadeyandran, uh, ultimately, uh, with the inflation, we are all having a big problem. Now, the real problem started with the dollar crisis, uh, with everything going up. So whether we can uh, bring the exchange rate uh, to a lower level, if that happens, then certainly uh, we will find that prices are coming down. Because when you say that the oil prices are coming down, then certainly the uh, uh, prices of all the products are coming down. So we may need to look at the key areas. I've been always talking about the 80-20 principle uh, where maybe uh, the 20% uh, of the uh, uh, the industries will bring in 80% of the income. So we may have to look at that. Plus also, uh, if you bring that in, then we can look at what are the areas that we can shed, you know, because uh, that, that is something that uh, will help the government. But uh, uh, we are now need everyone to understand the political machinery has to be done. So let me thank all our, our presenters, uh, especially uh, Mr. Atula, who started with the uh, presentation that was done, uh, went to detail. But I know that uh, uh, there were much more to be said, but certainly within the time limit, we were not able to go through it. And then, of course, uh, the two uh, experts on the taxes, they are both Suresh and uh, Gajendra, we did a good job. Three, no, three plus, actually. Hulanga, Dubinda, Hulanga was... Yeah, no, Dubinda is more on the business side. No, now he's the side, vice yeah. chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so the business side is very important. People should realize that. And uh, we are very happy that uh, Dubinda was able to make his presence because normally he comes as a tax expert, but here uh, he came on the business side because he's the vice chairman of the Ceylon Chamber of Commerce. And I'm sure that he will be able to play a major role and whatever he gave uh, was very useful. And then thereafter, uh, all the others spoke on the different sectors. Now, Dr. Rajapaksa really spoke on the SME sector and the impact that they are going to have definitely. 
they are going to uh, uh, run into a problem. And the government has also come up with this idea of going to set up uh, a restructuring uh, organization or a debt, uh, uh, I think, uh, on the debt area where they are going to set up, uh, where all the bad debts are going to be transferred. So that might be another area which might help the uh, uh, industry and uh, trying to restructure some of the business organizations that are there. And uh, uh, the other areas, especially on the agriculture area, Professor Buddhi uh, is always uh, studied all those things very well. So he gave a very, very uh, extensive uh, uh, paper and discussion on the agricultural sector, then the renewable energy, where we can reduce the cost, uh, I think as uh, Mr. Ria Sangani mentioned, if you look at some of the areas of uh, uh, some plants uh, where the the cost is very high, you know, the efficiency, productivity has to be looked at. In fact, what I'm saying is with this, uh, although they have said expenditure control, all these ministries, departments should have a very, very effective cost department. Because especially now, say, the electricity department, they are having it. Of course, the, elect the uh, engineers are doing it, but it has to be a cost department where cost and management accountants would be there, you know. So this has to be there in the CPC, everywhere. This was also recommended by the Committee on Public Enterprises, but no action taken. But we may now have to push for it in order that they can uh, 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 undertake this one, you know. So let me then, of course, on the hotel side, uh, I'm sure, Sanjeeva, if you all can bring in the much-needed exchange, uh, that will really help uh, in that area. So. Uh, uh, let me thank everyone and also all our participants. Uh, we had about a 354 participants and I find that a lot of them would like to hear more on the uh, tax, tax area and then uh, uh, maybe the business side, uh, although they are there, they should know that they have to, we have to contribute. Uh, otherwise, we will not be able to uh, really bring the country to a good level. Of course, uh, hardly any of the government servants or public servants are present in this one. So uh, it is uh, not much of contribution from their side, but uh, it's the uh, uh, professional bodies, the professional approach uh, that will have to be taken uh, as far as all these things are concerned. So let me uh, thank also uh, all, everyone who is there and also all participants uh, for their presence. And uh, CMA, as you know, is... Uh, a professional body. What we now find is uh, the purpose of CMA. CMA was set up in 2009 uh, as the National Professional Management Accounting Body in Sri Lanka. And uh, today, due to the crisis situation, the cost and management accounting area is becoming very important. Every day, prices are going up. But as uh, Professor Buddhi Marabe mentioned, that they must look at the reasons. Now, the poultry industry, why? What is the reason for this? And then solve that problem, then if they know that that is the reason for the cost uh, of uh, production going up, then they will be able to do it. So uh, that's how we have to uh, look at everything in a professional way and also make use of the professionals so that these matters could be sorted out. So once again, let me thank everyone. I think we have uh, gone a, more, a few minutes ahead, but uh, uh, it was very interesting and uh, uh, useful. I'm sure that uh, very many are having these sort of seminars and uh, today uh, and uh, the next few days, so we can hear much more from them. But uh, the steps taken are in the uh, right direction, as mentioned by everyone, but implementation, how they will implement is something that we have to say. So we have to be very strict on the implementation and on the implementation, I would suggest that it should be a public-private partnership where the private sector can also help the state sec sector to implement these things because government uh, is uh, really uh, maybe not have the expert management to do this, but the private sector has it. And I'm sure most of these uh, big organizations will provide uh, their expertise free of charge in order that uh, these uh, organizations can be uh, sorted out and the government will be able to come out of this problem. So once again, let me thank everyone and I wish you uh, all the very best and uh, that maybe uh, when we uh, will like to see you at the next uh, few seminars also that we are having uh, so that uh, we can play a role where the government, uh, uh, the uh, professionals, 
uh, and the experts in the industry sector, uh, the uh, services sector could bring this uh, to a good area. We could not discuss on the IT sector, but we had taken it up earlier. So these are all areas where there is a lot of gro growth potential. And of course, uh, Professor Buddhi, I think you all have to play a major role on the education front and see how we can increase the numbers. Huh? Maybe government can't afford to do this. Huh? Government can give 30 to 35,000. I think the budget says to bring foreign people, but I think that is uh, uh, not the solution because we need uh, uh, affordable qualification to be given. And that is uh, seen from the uh, CMA because we tied up with the Canadians and we gave a qualification at an affordable price. One tenth the price of foreign qualification. Now that's what we must seek and th those solutions are available. So certainly if we do that, we should give an affordable qualification and of course a good quality product. Uh, to the market and people will not have to go overseas because they're using a lot of foreign exchange that can also be saved. So thank you very much. And I'm sure that we can, we have, we have all contributed very much for this uh, success of this uh, seminar that we have had. And uh, let me thank on behalf of CMA to all of you uh, for this uh, wonderful contribution and for all our participants. Thank you and all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Han. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Professor. You.